Dr. Jonathan Edelman, our next speaker, um, who has a BA in philosophy from the University of California and a PhD in religious studies and theology from Oxford. His book entitled Hindu Theology and Biology, the Bhagavad Purana and Contemporary Theory uh, examines the possibility of dialogue between Hinduism and evolution. Edelman has written about scientific studies of reincarnation, the theory of karma and samsara, the doctrine of bhakti, and the Bhagavad Purana commentaries of Jiva Goswami, Sridhar Swami, and Vamsidhar. He's an assistant professor of religion at your own University of Florida, Go Gators, and will be uh, speaking to us today about the similarity and differences between India and Europe in the science and religion dialogue. So, there you go. That was officially our longest introduction. You probably wrote it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I did just come back from just no, Texas to be here. So I'm very I, happy to, thank you. to be here. I, 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 I came here in 2015 um, from a teacher, remember? Um, what do I do with that? Um, okay. Is that okay? It's kind of, it's kind of, I do not. That's just kind of droopy. Yeah. Um, I came here in 2015. The this BI did not exist then. <laughs> and as Kurt and kind of, there was enough of us to actually sit on Brahmatirtha's couches in his in his front room. Now we've got this whole organization, so many people coming, beautiful library, beautiful place to 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 hold this in. So it's been so gratifying. It's all really due to the hard work of so many people here. It's so nice to see so many people devoted to study, knowledge, and this has happened because of the hard work and dedication of the staff. So I want to thank them for putting this together. <clears throat> um, so the title of my talk is Similarities and Differences Between India and Europe and the Science and Religion Dialogue. And I kind of want to focus more on the religion side of this today. Um, some of the differences within the, the, the religion and religion as it pertains to science. So I, I'm not going to read a paper here. I'm going to kind of talk through my points. I have a paper that I've written. I'm going to kind of just ad lib through them here. Um, so I, what I want to argue here is that the sciences can be used to interpret Shabda Pramana, the scriptures, the Shastras, the Bhagavata, by dialogue. And this is the ideal way to read Shastra, i.e. As, as informed by the sciences. I want to talk about meaning making. We need, I'm going to argue here that we need all three pramanas. I'm sure you're all familiar with these terms, pratyaksha, anumana, and shabda. I'll be using them. Hopefully you are. <laughs> um, may, meaning making, we need all three pramanas to make sense of any statement, not just scriptural statements, but any statement. And I want to look at some of the particular similarities and differences between Indian and European contexts as, uh, as it approaches religion. So dialogue. Uh, I argue that Dialogue is a good thing. Dialogue is an interaction through words. It's it's uh it's going through something by using by using words or logos. It's a, it's communication. It's a conversation, but dialogue is really just a, a kind of purified conversation. Um, it's a it's not apologetics. It's not preaching, but it's the search for truth of the nature of things through talking through conversing. I think that dialogue is is necessary. Well, not dialogue. I think that conversation always happens anytime two groups of people, whether it's a scientist and human humanist come together or people from different places. Conversation is a natural feature uh, of, of life and conversation can be elevated and lifted up by dialogue. Science, so that's my kind of first claim about this, the first term that I'm using here. So science and religion both aim at the truth of things. That's my understanding of what they are as, as disciplines. Thus, if there's a conflict between, between them, then one of them is wrong, right? If they're both trying to hit the target, which is the truth, and they end up saying different things about the same thing, one of them's got to be wrong, or one of them has to be, one of them is misinterpreting what they're seeing or what they're saying. So I use interpretation here in a kind of particular way. Uh, you say the statement, the ocean is blue or there's fire on the mountain because I see smoke, whatever. In order to make sense of any mundane statement, even like that, the ocean is blue. 
you have to have some prior experience of of ocean of water of of blueness and be able to have the rational capacity to to take concepts and put them together. If I make a basic inference, I see smoke and therefore there's fire. You have to have some kind of understanding of the the connection between smoke and fire. You have to know what smoke looks like and be able to distinguish it from steam or or clouds or other things like that. And you have to have a kind of basic understanding what fire is. So to make an inference, you also need some kind of prior knowledge of what your 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 um, whatever the sentence is about. <clears throat> I'm going to fold that into my argument in a second here. Science is a human activity, and therefore it's it's obviously subjected to the limitations of the human limitations. But so is the the reading of scripture. When you interpret a text, it's also going through your human capacity to understand things. Therefore, it's also subject to many of the same human defects that science is. Thus, our approach to both science and religion should bear the spirit of an ongoing exploration through dialogue as a continuous quest for the truth of things. Dialogue is, in my view, the best form of explanation because we discover new things by opposition and difference. We learn about the world through, through, um, through, through, through looking at differences. I think that philosophy is the best mediator here. Philosophy as a discipline is able to look at different things, extract from their, es their essential uh, principles and their underlying assumptions and look at the bigger structures of things. That's why when you, the top degree at a university is always called a PhD, a doctorate of teacher of, of philosophy. So, okay, so we've got this idea of dialogue, of interpretation, the human nature of the, the, the nature, uh, the limitations on knowledge by our, our human limitations. Let me say a bit more about the three pramanas. The three pramanas are, pramanas are pradyaksha, anumana, and shabda, or the sense experience, inferential reasoning, and, and testimony. Science, I think, uses all three of them. Science is, as a shabda, as a, as a, as a set of words or language, it's used to interpret pradyaksha and anumana. You, scientists make sense of what they th see through some kind of shabda, some kind of linguistic understanding of the nature of things. And pradyaksha and anumana also give rise to shabda. Sh science as a discipline is about looking at things and making inferences about them and then formulating statements about the nature of things, creating shabda. Shabda is also used among scientists. Not every scientist recreates every experiment. Even experimental scientists, they don't do every experiment themselves. They rely on other people, so they read and hear other things, and they take that, that testimony as, as authoritative. There's a trust among scientists in the words that they say. Sanskrit is a type of shabda called apta vachana, a trust in the, the words of a reliable person. Religion also seems to be a mixture of shabda. It's not just, uh, it's not just scriptural statements. Um, shabda is a kind of theory that one gains from the tradition to make sense of pratyaksha and anumana. You learn about something and then you look at the world and you see it in a different way. It may not even make sense to see to see God without some kind of prior linguistic theoretical understanding of, of what you're seeing. Shabda give rise to, uh, gives rise to pratyaksha. It creates, you learn about something, you hear about something, and it gives rise to certain types of experiences. And pratyaksha also shapes the interpretation of 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 scripture, the way that you experience the practice of, of religion shapes the way that as it as that progresses over time or digresses over time, as the case may be, um, you understand and reach uh, Shabda in a different way. So the, the difference between Gaudiya Vaishnava and European science is, so let's keep that in the background. I'm gonna kind of now delve into some, some basic differences between how uh, East and West deal with the, these issues of science and religion. The differences between Gaudiya Vaishnava religion and European science is one of two sides of a, of a single civilization. I don't think we should look at Western science and, and Indian religion as, as two totally different things out and coming from two totally different places. The, the, uh, we know from the Sanskrit language that it's an Indo-European language is same as Greek and Latin, German, French, English. And I think that India is really just one 
Europe and India are really just two parts of one civilization. There's so many similarities between them. There's so many deep conceptual um, linguistic similarities between them that go back from, from their very origins, as far back as we know in time uh, about books, any of the oldest books we have, part of this larger Indo-European civilization. The words are cognate, many of the concepts are cognate or similar to one another. But there are some differences. The Bhagavata Purana is a, a, is a cosmological religion. The Bhagavata Purana is so deeply wedded to a very elaborate and detailed cosmology. Western religions are far less cosmological. The Hebrew Bible does not have is nearly as much to say about the nature of the cosmos as, as the Puranas do, for example. The Greek Gospels have even less to say about the nature of the cosmos. Christianity is, Judaism and Christianity, there is a cosmology there, but they are far less wedded to cosmology than, um, than the Puranic religions are. Medieval scholastic, medieval scholastic period texts like the Summa Theologica, this massive work of, of Christian theology in the medieval period, really says nothing about cosmology. It wasn't really the, the deep focus of the things. He did talk about how you can prove God's existence from the nature of, of the world, but it dealt more with general principles like how water becomes, becomes uh, is heated up over time. Um, and there must be some need for a sort, a sort of ultimate cause of things. But he doesn't deal with the specific nature of the cosmos. Francis Bacon, an early modern thinker, distinguished between the book of nature and the book of scripture. He said they should both be read independently and uh, one should not be, should not infringe on the other one. He wanted to separate the sciences from, from uh, scriptural interpretation. The early modern period also rejected Ptolemy's cosmology and moved into a totally new way of looking at the, the, uh, the cosmos with a, a sun-centered universe. Darwin was accepted for the most part by all major Christian theologians fairly quickly. There were oppositions, there still are oppositions to Darwin within the Christian, Jewish, and Islamic world, especially Christian and Jewish worlds, however, for the most part and a large part have accepted the basic idea of evolution. I recently watched Oppenheimer, maybe if some of you have seen that, there's a debate between Oppenheimer and Einstein, a theological debate at one point in the movie, Einstein says, no, there must be some underlying structure to quantum mechanics. Oppenheimer saying it's all just probabilities. Uh, Einstein says, on a basis of a theology, now there's got to be some underlying mathematical formulas that we just don't understand yet that give rise to the probabilities. But he didn't look to the, to the Hebrew Bible or to the Jewish tradition to provide specific cosmology. He rather looked at it to provide some general principles about the nature of things. Western Christianity broke away from a literal reading of the Bible fairly early on. Um, an articulation of the Western view is found in John Polkinghorne's statement about St. Augustine, a book in a book that Augustine call, uh, called The Literal Interpretation of Genesis, written in the fifth century AD. Polkinghorne says that Augustine is, quote, not concerned with some kind of naive biblical literalism. Rather, he acknowledged that if all well-established secular knowledge seem to conflict with the customary interpretation of scripture, then the latter must be reconsidered. If the sciences conflict with the Bible, we should go with the sciences. We need to rethink our understanding of the Bible. Augustine is a foundational theologian in the Christian church, Western Christian church. The Catholic catechism, catechism quotes him more than any other author. Aquinas quotes him more than any other, other author. He's read widely by the churches and theologians to this very day. So that's one of the big differences. You have a religion in the, in the West that's less wedded to a particular cosmology. And from a very early on period, there were these very strong voices within a tradition saying that now we have to separate theology from science, that we have to understand things in a, in a we, we should go away from a literal understanding of things. Coming back to my point here in the conclusion, I think the basic approach of negotiating science and religion in the West that of favoring, favoring their, the sciences <clears throat> and giving them a, a sort of autonomy in the study of nature is, is largely correct. I think, that's a, I think that's a right way for theology and philosophy to go. To read and interpret the cosmological claims of the Bhagavata Purana requires some type of prior scientific knowledge that is going to be based in some kind of projection anonymous. 
anumana, just as to read and interpret the, sa the statement, the ocean of blue requires some notion of blueness and water, and it requires the rational capacity to connect a quality to a particular thing. So the, the issue then is when you sit down and you read cosmological statements in the Bhagavata, what kind of prior knowledge are you bringing to it? Wouldn't it be good to bring the best and most accurate form of scientific knowledge that we have to, to bring to our reading of scripture if it is, a, if it is and you can contest this if you like, but if it is the case that reading is essentially the use of prior knowledge to, to make sense of a particular statement, wouldn't it be good to have the best form of prior knowledge that we can have? And what is the way to gain that best prior knowledge? At this point, as far as I know, the, the human race has come up with the sciences as a very reliable and effective way of generating um, natural knowledge. I'm not saying that all aspects of the sciences should be accepted without any question, because of dialogue. Dialogue necessitates a kind of back and forth, a pushing and a, a giving, a, a taking and receiving and things like that. I'm not saying that the, the, the that, that's where philosophy is very valuable. It can allow you to under to examine and scrutinize the philosophical and metaphysical presuppositions within the sciences. In summary, I'll end it here. If it is true that prior knowledge is required to interpret cosmological statements in scriptural texts or any sentence that there is, and if modern, modern science is the best tool for making scientific knowledge, which you can question, it may not be, then we must ask what prior knowledge is to be acquired to be able to best read and interpret the scriptures. The natural sciences are not perfect, but they are the best in my opinion, the most widely used methods that human beings use right now to produce knowledge of the world. Therefore, that I'm advocating, I'm saying that it would be um, a good thing to, to use the, the knowledge that we could call from the sciences to, to uh, generate an interpretation of scripture. The end. <laughs> And, and now I want, yeah, uh, actually I'll pass have, it over to you. Well, I will pass it back to you. We actually okay. have plenty of times for questions okay. for Dr. Okay. Elmer. So I will okay. Okay. Would you want to? No, you can do it. Yeah. You're, you know what you're doing. Okay. I, I saw a gentleman here first. Yes. Yeah, you describe and it seems you embrace the, the, the validity of separating in, in your theology and science to a great extent. And yeah. In our tradition, we believe that there's an energy which science can't identify, can't test, and therefore doesn't know about, which is fundamental to the oper to the actions that happen in in human, in, in the world, in the universe, yeah. which is spirit. Yeah. They can't understand it, they can't see it, they can't test it. <clears throat> so they don't even talk about it. Right. And to us, that's a big omission. Right. No, I, I, when, when I say that they should be separate, I, I don't um, don't discount that. That's where the dialogue comes in. That the sciences, I think, can progress in their own way and do their business in, in the way that they, they feel is the best way to do it. But dialogue is that insertion of one idea into another stream of thought. And then, so that, that's why I do advocate for, for dialogue, that there should be people of different metaphysical persuasions, ideas, talking to people that are doing the sciences so that they can uh, look at and, and understand what they're doing and try new things and try different things with the, the information they get from, uh, from other, other sources. But and likewise, it's a two. I think this dialogue is a two-way street. It's going through something together. It's going through a, a process of discussion together. Therefore, there there can be this this uh, refraction back where reflection back where uh, people who are doing metaphysics, religion, theology can gain from from what they learn from the sciences as well. Just a good yeah, yeah. We hold that consciousness. 
is a fundamental principle, fundamental energy that does not arise from matter. That's our position. Yeah. And I don't know how the dialogue is going to get resolved, but yeah, we sense. don't believe that they can prove that consciousness arises from matter. No, that's the challenge. That's, 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 a, that's one of the goals, I think, of the center, of the Institute, yeah. Um, yeah. Dialogue, I mean, in your... You're presenting a concept, a concept of dialogue as a conversation of give and take, or even like a dialectical position of creating new syntheses. But the dialogue that we see, the models of dialogue we see in the Bhagavatam, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, are one of a perfect spiritual master um, giving enlightenment to a submissive disciple whose heart is changing. The, the, the conception of knowledge in Bhagavad Gita that Krishna describes in the 13th chapter is not so much a knowledge of, you know, acquiring new information about the world, but a knowledge of changing one's character and one's uh, perception. So, yeah. how do you, yeah, um, how do you respond to that? That yeah, I think context? I think the that kind of model of dialogue is not what I'm talking about here. Uh, I think that's important. That's good if people want to engage in that. Super. But I, I'm I the this kind of dialogue I'm describing here is more of a conversation between equals. It's more of this person has a lot of knowledge. It's one type of knowledge. That person has a, a lot of knowledge. It's a, also a different type of knowledge. And they are sharing what they know as colleagues and peers. This is more of a, a kind of collegiate um, discourse among equals. Yeah. Which I think you, I, there might be, maybe it's maybe it'd be good to look at at the, 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 the Bhagavata and the Upanishads and so forth and see if there are those kinds of models as well. You know, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm not sure about this, but I have to look at it. But I think the the conversation between Krishna and Uddhava in the eleventh canto is is kind of a bit more like that. It's very, uh, it's very much uh, like the Bhagavad Gita, Gita, actually. Yeah, uh, and the Bhagavad Gita. Gita is also there. It's it does have this kind. Of, anyway, we could we could discuss. Arjuna like, surrenders to Krishna and then asks him questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's take one more yeah. question from that before we. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was a great talk. And this is actually just kind of a simple, straightforward question in terms of dialogue. So I was talking yesterday about conceptual relations between modern cosmology and that of the mm. Bhagavad Purana. How would someone from my background and, and you, how would we get together and actually produce something of use in an academic setting? I don't know of a pathway in there where this yeah. actual everyone talks about interdisciplinary but i never see it okay <laughs> like i never see an academic entry point for us to do collaborate that okay. way i have not decided that i can go yet but i've been invited to go to or to knows about this to the himalayas next month i um <laughs> Right. I, I want to go, but I, I didn't get it. I, I want to get what? <laughs> I wasn't invited. <laughs> um, I, when when you told me I would need to wear a mask when I rent landed in Delhi, you lost me. <laughs> but um, the one of the ideas I have is is a kind of reading, you know, taking a particular text and having people who are experts, a, a Sanskrit text, a passage from the Bhagavata, the Upanishads, what, with a commentary, a text that has some kind of commentarial tradition on it. And so you got different voices on that text within the tradition, looking at that text from a, a sort of traditional point of view and having scientists kind of look at the same text and making what they make out of it just without any of their knowledge. So if you're talking about time, space, mind consciousness all these things are there and for example sankhya yoga philosophy and theology what what are their understandings of it and and sort of generate this is the only way i know how to do it but basically generating the discussion out of a particular text and you you, you begin to read it together and interpret it together so the text becomes a kind of a locus of of your uh, of your discussion it gives a kind of grounding to the discussion, but then you bring in a lot of different kind of perspectives on it. That sounds incredible. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One last question before it's exposed. 
I'm trying to avert your head exploding. No, you're my best friend. I always consider you my best friend. Legitimate Upanishadic thing to happen. No, except when (laughs) everybody saying, yeah, then we'll work it out. Um, I was uh, Augustine, my limited understanding of Augustine, and you brought him up. Yeah. You know, it was a very relativistic thing. I mean, he was dealing with Greek science, and there's not much, you know, in the Bible. And to engage in discussion with culture at the time, you should be learned in the things that pass for knowledge. And of course, Greek science now is utterly irrelevant, nor do I right. appreciate that uh, Augustine right. really was concerned to put down core principles of his metaphysics on the line to discuss with Greek natural philosophers. So to what degree, I mean, outside of in trying to engage people in some proactive bhakti activity, the, the things that we're up, trying to engage with as the latest natural philosophy or science is going to be irrelevant in 50 years. Right. This so how the, much do you really, this is the, what, what is, um, to what degree does an investment cost benefit? This is, you know, this is what happens that when you go down this path, that the, the interpretation is something that requires a continual updating. I was talking to, I've got a, a, a kind of a new group of, friends here who are Aristotelians and uh, Augustinians and uh, Quininians. <laughs> um, but one of the points that one of my, Thomas, yeah. <laughs> one of the points that my friend made about, um, about Aristotle is that, yeah, he's got a totally different cosmology, but it doesn't mean that, oh, his science was totally out of date and he has no idea what he's talking about scientifically doesn't mean you close the book there's still a tremendous amount of value to reading aristotle and we should have people in universities and all over the world reading and translating and thinking about aristotle and reinterpreting him same with with so i think that the fear that if you it say that the cosmology is no longer relevant and and no western theologian i think is going to say hey greek cosmology yeah. right <laughs> that it was it's been it's been put to bed a long time ago but it doesn't mean that greek philosophy is is no, no longer no. relevant it's still a, the life blood of uh, yeah, yeah so. but we're talking about natural yeah. science so. Yeah. Would you like to have the last word here? You did just have. I did just have the last word. So I you have like to have the last. Word. No, I'm. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. All right. Thank you.